where did it all go wrong uh, for England? A really frustrating tournament. Of course, we've been through the whys and wherefores and everything else uh, and trying to work out why it all went wrong for the England side that came into the tournament with such expectations. Well, the uh, director of England cricket, Rob Key, has today been chatting to Jonathan Agnew. H how would you rate England's performance in this World Cup? Well, you want to mark out a 10, it would be right down the bottom, to be honest. I think for the side that we are, for the players that we've got, the quality that we've got, we've underperformed massively um, for lots of different reasons, I think. Um, we've overthought things, we've gone away from our style. When it's really mattered, it's all well and good talking about how you're going to play a certain way, how you're going to be on the front foot and play aggressive. But when it really matters, you've got to do it. And then at other times, you've got to soak up at the right time. And we've almost done the opposite when it's needed. So... I think in both departments with bat and ball we've been well below par and I'd be surprised if anyone really in our side feels that they've given an account of themselves of, you know, your job is about maximising your potential and playing to your ability. Whether you win or lose is one thing. You know, you can't always guarantee success but what, you, what you've got to try and do is make sure you're playing to the best of your ability and we've been a long way off that. And so who's responsible? Well, lots of different people. Players, management, myself. I mean, when you look at you know how our preparation into this it, it, it was what it was really we had obviously a long summer and then we went into the games against New Zealand but right from the start you know whether it's Josh Butler, Matthew Mott whenever it's been you know a question for me about who, what we're going to focus on here is it going to be 50 over is it going to be T20 is it going to be test cricket I've always chosen test cricket you know right the way from the end of the world T20 last year when it was a choice over test cricket in Pakistan who got the best players I've always the one who said, sorry, Test Cricket gets that focus at the moment. Then the same thing in South Africa. When there's a Test Series going on in New Zealand, I've always chosen Test Cricket. So really, I hold myself to, uh, at the top of that list. You know, It's not easy for coaches and captains when you haven't got the ability to plan and have your best team. That's not their fault. So I feel like it's, it's harsh if I turn around and blame the captain and coach when I hold myself accountable for that. They could have played against Ireland, of course. There should have been a few more games to have got this team together. Yeah, it would have been three more games in conditions, nothing like what we have now. And our decision then was that actually we felt that they were going to go into a long World Cup, as we know, and that those guys who had had a, a lot of them, some of them, you know, had, had an Ashes series, then going into domestic short-form cricket, then into the New Zealand series, we thought, Do you know what, actually the best thing here is to rest them to get them ready for what's going to be an arduous World Cup. You could say that they should have played against Ireland. Would that have made any difference? I don't think so. I don't think the whole World Cup hinged on the fact they did or didn't play against Ireland. It was all done way before that. A couple of things surprised me. Um, interviews before the tournament with senior players, including the captain, starting with the difference between T20 cricket and, and 50 overs cricket. Um, and how players would cope with that. And on every occasion I asked it, it was kind of battered away, almost as being irrelevant, um, like, oh, we'll cope, Paul. <laughs> now, that, I think, until perhaps the last couple of games, had been pretty much the way they played. Yeah, I, possibly. I mean, there's times, I think, when we weren't aggressive enough, really, especially in the power play. You know, there's times in which when you watch an England team play, no matter who's bowling at you, they're going to come at you and we're going to set the tone, which is actually what we did in the very last game. In the very last game, on a tough pitch, we actually went out there and when the, the option we took was to be aggressive. And as I said at the start, there's times when actually we needed to actually soak up pressure and we went the other way. So I don't think it was just a case of we went one way and that was it. We actually didn't adapt to conditions at all. We're in a place where I think, you know, sometimes 2.30 is enough and other times 3.50 is not enough. Mm. And you've got to think on your feet quick enough and you've got to be able to adapt. And we didn't do that. And I, I myself, you know, we started overthinking what we should have been doing. I think if we'd have gone back now, you look at the way that the last couple of games we played, if we won the toss, we had a bat. You know, we didn't know that at the start. We didn't have, we weren't married to a way of going about how, what was our best way to go about things, you know, and that became, that was due at times to a lot of overthinking, probably due as well. In the perfect world, we'd have come out here and played 50 over cricket way before this competition. So we got used to these conditions because we were almost going like, we almost probably felt, right, okay, we've got a good understanding of things here, you know, when the dew comes down and then it actually becomes easier to bat. But that wasn't the case. If you didn't get through to the dew, if you were six or seven down by that time, um, so I think we underestimated um, how tough it was going to be reading those conditions and we got a lot wrong. Yeah. Uh, the, the second was, um, I haven't sensed the feel of 
being defending champions. And uh, my point there is I spoke to Joss Butler before it began and said how would it feel defending your, your crown, as it were. And it wasn't a case of, well, yeah, they've got to come and get it off us. Well, like, well, it's going to be a fresh start for the existing players here. And it, and it doesn't seem that England have really challenged others to come and, and, and take their crown away from them. What you say and do in interviews is irrelevant, really. As I say, it's all about what you do. It's what the team sounds like. It's, 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 the, it's the impression that you're giving to people who have been following this tournament. Yeah, but let's, let's get it right. It dep- how you go out there and play, the style that you go and play, and is what defines how good a team you are, what defines how you go about defending, attacking, whatever you want to say, whatever soundbite people want to give. Now, I'm thinking more psychologically, Rob. I mean, if you look at the way England have played in this tournament, yeah. they have not played like world champions. They haven't looked like they're the best in the world. Come and get us. Yeah, correct, but that's for the reasons that I've said, not because of what they say to you in an interview. You know, how people deliver interviews is one thing, but actually how you go out there, every single individual, take responsibility to go out there, whether it's it's your job at the top to go and put pressure on the opposition to actually send out a message and then go on from there whether you're the number three whether you're number four wherever it is to make that to make the right decision at the right time to go out there and play the cricket that you know you're capable of is what it's all about really and that's not what that's what we haven't done at any stage you know what Josh Butler says in an interview some people as you know are very good at interviews some people aren't I mean I employ or interview lots of people for lots of jobs and what you find half the time is who's good at an interview and that's it you know it's how you what you, you're judged on what you do out on the pitch and what, what we've done out on the pitch hasn't been good enough mm. what about these contracts Rob um, you, you come from a dressing room environment you know how divisive talks of pay and, and conditions and money and all those mm. things can be why were those contracts announced publicly halfway through the tournament? And when did the players first know? When did David Willey first know that he was going to be the only player in this squad, in fact, the only one of 29 players who was not on a contract? So he, everyone knew, I reckon, around the 19th. It was before the competition. They all knew. So it was before the Ireland series, actually, that they all sort of knew where they stood. So when they all got on the plane, they knew where it was. I spoke a lot to David Willey at that time, and he clearly wasn't happy, that's right. But I explained to him why we were going in a different direction. The contract system had changed. Things like the incremental contracts that people spoke about, they'd gone actually, were into development contracts then, you know, and the people saying, well, why didn't David Willey get an incremental contract? Well, one, because they're gone, and the other thing, because the people on development contracts are young players that we are hoping are going to go on to be the next thing. Some of those young bowlers are now people we see for the future who are going to go through, and we're starting them off now, who are going to go through. They're, they're going out on the Lions. David Willey's not going to go on the Lions. He's not going to go out there and spend his winters developing his game to become one of the next multi-format bowlers because we need our bowlers like other teams have got who are all phase bowlers in white ball cricket who are test bowlers as well who are running up you watch the best bowlers in the world in this competition it's Shammy, Stark, Hazelwood, Cummins, Rabada you know it's some of the best bowlers in the world so that's what we need to if England are going to have another great era it's going to be those guys that take us forward so that's why we're investing in those guys doing it why it was announced at that time so they all got their offers then. There's then things going backwards and forwards between the lawyers in terms of just the terms of conditions. You know, it's a 108-page document that they're just doing the finer details of that. It's not a negotiation, it's just finishing up the contract. They then, when the, they get the all clear from TEP, they then sign those contracts. So in those, all they had to do was say how many years they wanted. If you'd been offered multi-year deals, and you know how the media landscape works. So in the middle of the tournament, everyone signed their contract. We then made, well, I made the decision then, right, Ben Stokes, the England Test captain, has said he only wants a one-year deal. Now, since I've started this job, every single thing ends up in the media. When I offered 26 contracts to everyone on the 20th or the 19th, that evening, every single one is in the Telegraph. Players have agents, all these kinds of things. There's links everywhere, as you know. So my decision, really, was that we're just going to get in front of this, be as transparent as we can, and we're going to actually explain what has happened with contracts and why. That's why we did it. The, the thought that, you know, it, it's never an easy job this at times from the decisions you have to make. So this, people were saying, well, why don't we just put them off? So that would have meant, so the contract cycle starts on October the 1st. They all get paid on October the 20th. 
Had we not done that, we'd have been losing in this World Cup, and the story would have been no player's been offered a contract, no player knows his future, no player knows what he's done. So they're the decisions you make. You also listen to every player base and say, we all knew what happens, we don't feel it was a distraction. Things like, oh, it creates a hierarchy. There's been a hierarchy, a, we're hierarchical beings, there's hierarchy in everything, there'll be a hierarchy. It's just the way we live. There's a hierarchy in every industry. Every family has a hierarchy. Every central contract has had a hierarchy from the Ben Stokes and the people who get paid up the top to the people down the bottom. So there's been a lot said, there's been a lot of narrative being used with this, that one hasn't come from ours, and also I don't think has been relevant at all, to be honest. Do you think the board has been rather bullied into these contracts? I'm looking at some of the three-year deals. Looks like a good deal to me. Crikey. <laughs> well, how, how many games is Mark Wood going to play in, in three years, for, for, for instance? And when's, when's Matthew Potts going to play his first game? I mean, there seem to be some, some pretty generous deals around there. Yeah, but you've got to remember it's a different landscape now. So not only, the, the thing I like about it, so it's not only about what you're doing for England, it's our best cricketers are now attached to England. You know, our summer is so important. So now anyone on those central contracts, you're not going to go and be able to play in America. You're not going to be able to go and play in the CPL. You're not going to be able to go and enhance other competitions in our summer around the world. You are committing to English cricket. So it's not just about the days have changed where it's just like, right, well, he's not playing for England. It's not about that anymore. It's about actually Matt Potts is going to be doing stuff out in the UAE. So at some stage he will come good. And we're hoping that he's going to become one of the guys because we're going to need a battery of fast bowlers that he's going to take us forward and that's the thing with these contracts and they're on completely different values as well not everyone is getting the same amount of money right at the top some of them are right down the bottom of that people like Ryan Ahmed who are very much at the start of their journey we now control what you're going to do it's like no no you're not going to go off and play in every franchise whenever you want do whatever you want you're going to go to the UAE to the Lions because we want you potentially for a test tour in India so we're going to start preparing you for that you know and that's not what the David Willies and people of this world are going to want to do so that's why these guys are getting contracts and again they're all at very different levels so I think it's one of the best things I think we now have 29 because there's what three development contracts you know of our best players committed we've actually turned around to the player and said come on then what do you want to do now then? And they've committed to English cricket. I think that's a great thing. That's a much better thing than other countries that are losing players. You know, I've watched Quinton de Kock out here. He's one of the best players. You know, I love watching Quinton de Kock bat, you know, hopefully not against us doing really well. He's not playing test cricket anymore in South Africa. I think that is such a shame. And we in England are not at that point yet. And long may that continue. And what's it cost the game, these contracts? Well, in ter- well look, finances. There's been more money added to the pot, but you know it's an extra three and a bit million, something like that, I'd say. But I wouldn't say that that's, you know, in the big scheme of things, you know, compared to what England men's cricket delivers, I don't think that's a huge amount of the pie, really. And you've got to remember that everything that these players do enhances our game. So things like recreational cricket, things like the money coming into our game comes from what these players are doing. Obviously, they've not done it particularly well out here in the World Cup. But it's so important that we have our best players playing in our competitions in our, for, for England that we're able to put out, as best we can, the best team possible. What stopped us in the past has been the schedule. But now with these contracts, hopefully we're going to have the best of our players. And we've got the flexibility, because not everyone's on a multi-year deal. You know, So these guys will be able to, as some of the older guys drop off, we've got the best young players coming in, and we might add a bit to that. Um, so I think it's a great thing going forward. Um, and I don't regret that in any way. I was, you know, as I say, the things like the announcements, it was the lesser of two evils at times. You know, And it would all have been sorted if we played a bit better. You know, Then people wouldn't be complaining as much. David Willey said that in a conversation with you, you challenged him to prove you wrong. He's top of the averages, he's led the attack, and certainly in the second half of the tournament, man of the match last night, has he proved you wrong? No, uh, prove me wrong as in would I do anything different? No, I probably wouldn't, to be honest. Um, I think that David Willey, it, it's good timing. I think over the last year or so, you know, I think he spoke on an interview I saw and said that he, you know, retirement had been on his mind for a while. We've spoken in the past about, you know, he's had times when, you know, he's been on an incremental contract and that he actually 
hasn't wanted to play for England so he could go out and play for the IPL, you know, last year in Bangladesh. So I think that you get to these points in life where actually it's been a good end for David Willey. I'm really pleased that he's gone out there and been able to play and show what he can do. Um, but things come to a natural end and I'm pleased that he got the send-off that he wanted. Um, but it's time for England... England to move on and we start looking at investing in some of these younger players that hopefully can take us into a great era of English cricket. You have to be ruthless sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. Okay. What about Matthew Mott? Uh, you've, you've talked about responsibility, uh, pointed the finger in a number of directions in a very interesting and candid interview, Rob, and I appreciate that. Um, uh, are you going to be ruthless with him? I mean, does, does he have your full support? Yeah, he does. You, you, coaching is pretty simple, you know. You, 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 your job, you're, you're judged by your results, but you're also judged by the way that your players go out and play, and they haven't done that at all, and Matthew Mott would be the first one to say that. But I, as I said at the start, I find it... I find it a position to be in where I'm blaming Matthew Mott for this when, you know, many conversations I've had to say to him, right, Matthew, sorry, you're not going to have your best team. You're not going to have Joe Root, Ben Stokes, all of these people, because the test team's going to get that, you know, and I'm sorry that's going to happen. So the first time it goes wrong, I'm not going to sit here and go, actually, right, you should have done this, you should have done that. We'll have some pretty honest conversations, as you do in these things, and say, right, what are you going to do to improve this? But as far as I'm concerned, you know, he gets my full backing. Um, and an opportunity to try and turn it round. Yeah. And he will have a chance fairly soon, I guess, in the West Indies. You've, you've, you've put some new names in there. You've, you've, you've rested some familiar ones. Um, I, I guess that's with, what, a nod to the Test Series coming up here in mind in, in most cases? Uh, yeah, in some people, like, that's the other thing, you know. And what I don't want to do is ever make you know, excuses about schedules and stuff like that. Certainly, I'm not going to go and talk about domestic cricket and that. That's nothing to do with it. People like Joe Root, you know, Joe Root has done what, the Pakistan Test Series last year, the ILT20, New Zealand Test Series, straight into the IPL, straight into the Ashes, then the 100, then he's gone into, what, the New Zealand ODI Series, then he's gone, in, gone into this, then he's going to have that India Test Series. So you're right, people like Joe Root, I'm not of the opinion that Joe Root at 33, we should stick a fork in him and say that, Joe, you're done in this format. You know, it's for him to get back to his very best at this and then he'll be available for selection as far as I'm concerned. Same with people like Johnny Bairstow, Mark Wood, who you're trying to get them ready. You know, Johnny... <coughs> obviously hasn't played as much as Joe but just before the Ashes we weren't sure if he was going to be able to play, walk or do anything and then he's not stopped and it's not just the amount, it's the intensity that it has and I'd say that's probably had a hindrance on his own form out here so Johnny, I'm pretty honest with Johnny and said right you need to spend this time getting yourself ready, getting yourself fit getting yourself, your body into a position where you can go through what might be a gruelling tour of India um, because for lots of different reasons you've not had that opportunity you know we've picked you and you've been flat out since then um so uh, other reasons for other guys people like david milan in t20 cricket um you know he, he's not had we believe he's not had the best form in t20 cricket whether that's domestic cricket in the hundred or the last year so we're pretty honest with him i said well you know you've got to get back to what made you what he was ranked number one in the world mm. two or three years ago whenever it was um so if you want to get in that world cup squad and there'll be plenty of franchise cricket and all this stuff for these guys to play to show what they show us what they can do um they've got to go out there and do it really you know and, and in that top three in the t20 for that world cup we want aggressive batsman who can take on the power play and move the game forward uh, and put pressure on the opposition so that's for anyone in county cricket out there that's what you've got to do last couple rob because uh, you've done uh, been very honest thank you um so players like root stokes uh, and you can list off those senior players with a world cup in four years time mm -hmm. you're not going to draw a line under them now and, and look and look to build for for that no, no, the, the, I don't ever see a, a, a time where actually, especially for people at 33, 34, yeah, you would know, Graham Gooch was probably his best years were 30 to 40. I don't see a time where you ever have to turn around and make definite answers to anything. Where you turn and say, no, no, you know, everyone seems to want to go, right, they're done, bang, get rid of them, they're done, bang, get rid of them. No, no, if they're the best players and they, in four years' time, they're going to be the best players, then they can play. But at the moment, other people are getting an opportunity, like they did a few years ago, and we got such exciting talent to go out there and become the next great England team in white ball cricket, which, bar five weeks 
which completely come at the wrong time, we've been and we need to get back there pretty quickly. And final one, you are still World T20 World Champions. How are you going to ensure, Rob, that there isn't a repeat come, come the World Cup in June? Yeah, well, we've just got to make sure we don't make the same fundamental errors we've done through this. You know, commit to the style and the way in which we want to play. Make sure we make decisions right. There'll be things that I've got to do from my side to, to make that decision making easier as well. You know, we've come into this country, we've probably got no experience in our coaching setup of people in these conditions. You know, so when it's nearly like, it feels like, you know, it's hotter than the sun in Mumbai and you're thinking about dew and all of this stuff, someone turns around to you and says, by the way, you don't do that here because by 10 overs you, you're not going to be able to bowl it all seems so simple now when you look at it but they're the things how can I help and enhance our decision making in this setup you know and as a player you know I had to do this a lot as a player you, and as a captain you know I never you know you always look at everyone else actually you just look at the things you've done right and I've done plenty wrong in this and we need to make sure that I get I do it better next time the thoughts of England's director of cricket there, Rob Key, chatting to Aggers early on today in Calcutta as England head home, rather tails between legs, Prakash Rokankar at the end of a tournament that I think has uh, shocked many in terms of England's performance, but he did uh, take uh, a degree of responsibility there and, and you can ask for no more than that. I, I must confess I, I've had the uh, <clears throat> pleasure actually of, of listening to the entire interview uh, sitting here in the in the com box and, and you know I have to say uh, coming where I come from and our part of the world I wish we would hear uh, this kind of transparency you can argue what's right and wrong and you can argue could things be done differently I think he's he's been uh, he's batted with the full face of the bat as you would say um, uh, you know there, there probably were a couple of nicks here and there but that doesn't matter I think when you get uh, the top man uh, speaking such clear thoughts Ideas. Some of them may be unpopular. Some of them maybe individually are seen to be not quite the right thing. But that's the direction. Leadership is about making hard calls when they're required and then taking the responsibility for it. And that's that's what he's done. Yeah, England have announced their one-day squad for uh, the upcoming games in the Caribbean. They've uh, named uh, a squad. I think there's a few surprises in there for the ODIs. Butler as captain, Ren Ahmed, Gus Atkinson, Harry Brook, Bryden Carr, Zach Crawley, Sam Curran, Ben Duckett, Tom Hartley, Will Jacks, Liam Livingston, Ollie Pope, Phil Salt, Josh Tung and John Turner. So those from the World Cup squad that have kept their place. Uh, Butler, of course, the captain. And then uh, Atkinson, Brooke, Sam Curran, Liam Livingston are the, uh, are the players that retain their spot. So no place for David Milan, no place for Johnny Bairstow. We don't quite know what the reasons for that would be. And so uh, we'll... I suppose we're left to speculate and wonder and all these things inevitably uh, when you ha when you have a squad uh, a squad announcement like the one we've had for the uh, for the England ODI and T20 squads Daniel Norcross has come to join me and it is those those I suppose names that have been left out Dan as much as anything as, as much as those that have been included with Milan and Bairstow missing I think they're the most interesting of the two aren't they mm. because what we're led to believe is that Bairstow has been told to get fit for the test series but Milan has been dropped and you look at um, a bad campaign and often it's a person whose numbers aren't the worst who ends up being a fall guy I think back to 2013-14 in the Ashes when Michael Carberry opening the batting for England averaged it's only 28 but it was higher than anyone else I think in the side maybe level with Peterson and he was jettisoned immediately um, I can sort of see why they're thinking Milan's of an age when he's not going to be around in four years' time. Um, he doesn't probably feature in their very best T20 squad, but it, it, it seems a little harsh. It looks like that they've moved on very specifically from that. Um, in the T20 squad, though, you've still got a lot of the old stages still there, a lot of the T20 side that won the last World Cup, and obviously some listeners are going to be thinking... Is that not making the same mistake again well, that the, England made by picking so many of the 2019 squad for the 2023 World Cup? Well, let me go through that T20 squad. It's Butler again and uh, Ryan Ahmed, Moeen Ali, Gus Atkinson, Harry Brooks, Sam Curran, Ben Duckett, Will Jacks, Liam Livingston, Tamal Mills, Adil Rashid, Phil Salt, Josh Tung, Reese Topley. So in the T20 but not ODI squad, John Turner and Chris Wokes for that squad. Yeah, and look, there are some new names in there which are exciting, but... Um, You've still got Moeen Ali, you've still got Adil Rashid. Um, Adil Rashid didn't 
performed badly in this World Cup, but Moeen Ali, by his own admission, was a bit off the pace. Is he going to be back and fit and firing and, you know, at his best for a T20 World Cup? I don't know. Um, is Chris Wokes really, you know, what England want for that T20 World Cup? And there's the elephant in the room, really, which is Joffre Archer, mm. who England continue, like the sort of, just be, be yearning for this, this character who's just always just on beyond the horizon and I, I wonder if that's starting to become a fantasy and, and one that's holding back um, England ever so slightly.